Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation. We've been doing uh, a series of videos since uh, the very beginning of the first lockdown on the sorts of issues that we were covering in the real world. And many of those were environment related. As some of you may know, we do a monthly uh, sustainable finance meeting with Ben Caldicott from Oxford, but we also look at environmental and social and governance issues from time to time. And one of the big issues in the environmental area that we have never really looked at is uh, maritime pollution. Uh, shipping, for those of you who are uh, aware of all of this, is said to, cre to create approximately somewhere between two and a half and three percent of global uh, CO2 emissions. Cruise ships in particular are notorious and because it isn't just carbon dioxide, it's also sulfur dioxide, ox oxide and nitric, nitric oxide. Um, it is argued in one study anyway that the 40 ships, 46 ships operated by Carnival Cruise Lines emit sulfur dioxide equivalent to 260 million cars uh, and the 203 cruise ships that were examined in one other study produced it, 62 kilotons of uh, sulfur dioxide, 155 kilotons of nitric oxide, and so on and so forth. Uh, the sulfur standards for uh, maritime fuel are, it is said, I have read, 100 times more, uh, shall we say, polluting than, than for cars. Uh, so it's a big issue. It's a big issue, and it's a big issue that uh, is, is increasingly being looked at by governments and also by the industry itself. And the financial industry has recently set up a number of principles, the Poseidon principles, for increasing the, uh, the, the uh, pro for providing a global framework for what they call responsible shipping finance. Uh, the intention is to drive the decarbonization of the industry. There are a whole host of issues that are involved in this, not least around China, around a sort of northern route, which would uh, eliminate many of the, uh, much of the pollution, and also the question of shipping versus pipelines. But 90% of the present time of world trade is done by shipping and it is a major, major polluter. So I'm delighted that we've got two experts in the field to discuss this. Bob Sanguinetti is the chief executive of the UK Chamber of Shipping. He's been there for three years before that. Uh, he was uh, the CEO of the Gibraltar Port Authority, and before that he spent 30 years in and around the Navy. Um, the Charter, the British uh, Chamber of Shipping, has 190 members, uh, and it is a, a very important player in this, in this field. Michael Parker uh, has many hats, but one of them is as chair of the Principles Drafting Committee for the Poseidon Principles. He's also uh, chairman of uh, the Global Shipping Logistics and Offshore at City and the Vice Chair uh, for Corporate and Investment Banking for EMEA at City, and Chairman of the Corporate Banking Division. So he's a big cheese in City, but also a very big cheese in shipping finance, where he has been a major player for 35 years. I'm going to ask Bob, if he would, to talk for 10, 15 minutes, or as long as he wants, on to try and give us a sort of 15,000 feet view of the problem and of some of the initiatives that are and currently being undertaken. Have I got the size of the problem right? Am I underestimating it? Or am I overestimating? Can I give you Bob Sanguinetti? Bob. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for, for, for that introduction. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll extend the introduction by saying a few words about the Chamber of Shipping um, to, to, to add some, some context, to, if I might. Um, uh, you rightly point out that we represent about 190 uh, companies, um, half of which are uh, ship owners, ship operators, ship managers, uh, and the other half are other um, maritime-related uh, service providers. So we, we have uh, insurance uh, clubs, p &I clubs, uh, we have uh, maritime law firms, we have class societies and, and others. Uh, but on, on, the, on the shipping side of it, uh, among our membership, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the large uh, energy majors, BP and Shell. Uh, we've got uh, most of the cruise companies. Uh, we've got most, if not all, of the ferry companies that operate uh, in and around uh, the UK. A large number of uh, container, uh, container lines, uh, dry and wet cargo, uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, uh, we've got offshore support specialist vessels, 
um, and tug operators. So, so quite, quite a breadth of representation. And, and our role is to promote and to champion shipping uh, in the UK and from the UK. Uh, and we do that by working closely with uh, government uh, and by working with other national and international organizations and associations to represent the interests and to promote the interests of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the UK uh, shipping community. Uh, it's been a particularly busy uh, year. Um, uh, 2020, uh, I think, went by in a, in, in a flash. Uh, and what are the issues that we've been focused on? Um, I, I would say, um, first and foremost, uh, it is tackling climate change and decarbonisation in particular. And that has uh, rapidly and recently become uh, shipping's top priority. Uh, yes, we've been very focused on COVID and COVID recovery, uh, and of course on uh, the transition of the UK away from the uh, EU. And just saying a, a, a few words on, uh, on, on those two. Uh, on COVID recovery, um, COVID has affected shipping in the same way as it's affected uh, almost any other industry in the world. Um, but uh, it's, it's also shown how resilient um, shipping is. Global trade has gone through a few uh, twists and turns during the COVID period, initially starting with a complete drop, uh, if not cessation, uh, on the supply side of uh, uh, the, uh, the equation uh, when China went into lockdown. Uh, and then more recently, uh, as the rest of the world went into lockdown, uh, demand just ground to a, to a halt. And we're now seeing the after effects, uh, the ripple effects, if you like, of, uh, of those, uh, those movements. Um, and uh, just before Christmas, we, we heard about port congestion, about misplaced containers and so on. Uh, that's um, really, uh, as, as expected, uh, shipping uh, reacting and recovering uh, from those uh, shocks, strategic shocks uh, of uh, the first half of 2020. But shipping has continued to deliver despite that. Um, we had, in the first instance, from a UK perspective, uh, the challenges of uh, ferry companies who provide uh, most of the freight in and out of uh, the UK, um, struggling uh, to make ends meet uh, with a complete loss of uh, passenger revenue. Uh, so we, we secured some uh, financial support from the UK government to, uh, to, to uh, improve the viability of those essential routes. Uh, cruise, and I'll come back to, on to cruise later in a different context, but the cruise industry uh, went into voluntary suspension very early on and is still there. Um, and they've, they've worked extremely hard uh, collaboratively to come up with a set of uh, proposals or uh, uh, protocols uh, that uh, create what I believe is probably uh, among the most, if not the most, uh, COVID uh, friendly environment uh, for, for travel and, and transportation. But there's more work uh, to be done there. Uh, and then, of course, the other sectors have, uh, have had their ups and downs, uh, but, uh, but, but they're doing their business as you'd expect them to. Um, the one issue uh, which has been constant throughout is the huge stress uh, that uh, crew members uh, have been under uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, and, and I can't help but uh, uh, perhaps chuckle, there's, there's no humour in it, uh, when um, we saw the huge amount of um, time and effort uh, spent on ensuring that we could all enjoy our Christmases with our loved ones at a time when there were hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of seafarers who've not been able to get off the ships for weeks and in some cases months, uh, and in some cases over two Christmases. Uh, and that issue is still there. So it's being managed through a huge amount of work, effort and expense. Um, but I would say it's no more than being managed rather than being um, uh, resolved. Uh, and that uh, issue continues. So throughout the entire pandemic, um, global trade, um, um, and, and which uh, shipping provides for 90% uh, of, uh, has been uh, going around the world uh, and delivering uh, almost um, uh, unimpeded as a result of the fantastic work of, uh, of these um, seafarers. Um, moving on to, uh, on, on to Brexit, uh, well, we're now on the other side of the transition period, um, and um, I think we're all as, um, as, as pleased as anyone else uh, that a deal was struck um, at the last minute. Um, again, um, the, the, the UK or the EU uh, is the, the UK's uh, single largest trading partner, uh, so um, our objectives throughout um, the, uh, the, the Brexit uh, period was to ensure 
uh, that a trade could continue to flow freely between the UK uh, and the EU. Uh, and that clearly is now the case, uh, a tariff free and quota free. There will be friction because um, where checks have been introduced, uh, customs and, and, and so on, uh, where previously there were none, um, will um, <clears throat> will take uh, the time for, for systems to, to bed in, for the infrastructure to be in place and so on. So um, we, we will see some changes there, perhaps slightly less reliance on the uh, short sea uh, channel routes <clears throat> and uh, diversion of some of the traffic uh, onto the longer routes across the North Sea. Uh, but, um, but so far, so good. It's still early days, and we'll see how that pans out. Excuse me, please, while I take a glass of water. Uh, let's move to uh, the problems you face in the in the carbon and the pollution area. That would be so. So moving on to uh, uh, on to on on Q, moving moving on to the the, the issue of the day, um, and, and it's de decarbonisation. Um, uh, the, the the UK Chamber supports the um, IMO's uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets set in 2018 uh, on an international um, basis, and. Um, the UK Clean Maritime Plan from the UK perspective. And we welcome uh, the Prime Minister's recent announcements on the Green Industrial Revolution, uh, which we believe uh, will have a maritime um, component. This is um, zero emissions by 2050. That is what the official government position is in the UK. Th that, that is the UK, that, that's, a, that's the UK target. Um, from a maritime perspective, international target, it's a reduction of greenhouse gases uh, by 50%. Uh, in 2050 from the 2008 um, uh, levels. Um, the targets are ambitious, hugely ambitious, uh, but we believe in the maritime sector that they're realistic, uh, but um, it will be a transformational <clears throat> process that we will need to follow to get us to those targets in 2050. And the reason for that is simply that the technology simply does not currently exist at scale uh, to provide us with those solutions, uh, whether it's the fuels, whether it's the propulsion, uh, whether it's the infrastructure, uh, which will cost billions, if not trillions, of uh, of dollars, is simply not there. Can you look, Key point tell us exactly about those three: fuel, propulsion, infrastructure. Fuel. At the present time, you're using dirty, high sulfur fuel. Uh, we're using a combination of, uh, of, of high sulfur, low sulfur fuels. Uh, we're using LNG. Uh, and in uh, short sea operations, um, um, battery technology is coming on apace. Uh, and there's also other solutions um, uh, like methanol, uh, ammonia, hydrogen, and so on. Uh, but, but those but at, are. At the moment, what's, what, what's the split at the moment? Well, the, the, particularly the for ocean is, going, is, is, is largely low sulfur high sulfur fuel with uh, sulfur abatement technology uh, and increasing LNG um, as an interim measure, if you like, because LNG on its own would not get you to, uh, to the, the, uh, uh, the carbon uh, emission targets uh, that we're looking at. But, uh, but, but, but the technology is simply not there at scale. And, and if I give an example, um, we see in the car industry um, how battery technology is moving apace uh, and that's benefited tremendously uh, from uh, from public finance uh, as well as uh, private investment uh, to get to where we are at the moment, and we're still a long way from clearly a an all electric car uh, environment. Uh, but, but nonetheless, um, when you're looking at the different scales, um, a large container ship would require tens of thousands of batteries that a Tesla car has at the moment to power it to get itself across. Uh, the oceans. So the, the, the technology simply is not there. So it's going to be transformational. Uh, it's going to take time. Uh, we don't have time. Uh, you do say that, um, uh, you, you did say, uh, you talked about um, how um, uh, polluting the industry is. Uh, I would say yes, it represents 2%, um, 2.5% uh, two of, uh, of, of total uh, emissions. Uh, but let's not forget using another figure that you've quoted already. Uh, that uh, that shipping provides for ninety percent of global trade. So, uh, in, in relative terms, I, I think uh, it's perhaps not as uh, as polluting an environment or uh, an industry as you suggest. But we do acknowledge that we need to move on and we need to move quickly to achieve those targets. What about the role of China here? I mean, China and Korea, for that matter. These are very major players. 
which are some, if you like, outside the, the Western consensus on some of this, are the Chinese participating in efforts to upgrade their uh, their fleets and also change from high sulfur to low sulfur fuel as an interim measure? Uh, yes, the, 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 what, what we see in, uh, uh, in, in the rest of the world is replicated in, uh, in China in terms of the limits that they impose the, the themselves. Um, we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing movement there. Um, another uh, interesting development uh, with um, uh, Mr. Biden winning the, the US presidential election, uh, perhaps we'll see a more proactive uh, US uh, on the global stage in the IMO driving forward some of these uh, uh, some of these uh, regulations, but uh, but but we 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 mustn't uh, single out uh, shipping or or the, the shipping sector on its own because uh, other sectors, other industries are facing similar challenges. Clearly, uh, the the targets that need to be met uh, will have to be met by others as well as shipping. The technologies um, to an extent will be shared. Uh, so another key point that I would make is, is that um, we will only achieve these targets um, working in collaboration with other industries and working in collaboration nationally and internationally. And um, we, we need to see collaboration between owners, charterers, manufacturers, academia, and the research and development uh, establishment to an extent that we've not seen um, um, before. What, what, just let me ask you about new bottoms, uh, new builds now uh, in terms of their polluting capacity, their, their, their polluting impact relative say to build 20 years ago, because the lifetime of a VLCC is what, 15, 20 years? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But what's, how, how much more efficient now are they and how much less polluting now are the bills now than they were 20 years ago? Well, it, 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 made? It, it, it depends on uh, the different types of ship, but, uh, but, but generally speaking, the ships coming online now uh, are much more efficient than those that would have come online 15, 20 years beforehand. Uh, the technology clearly is, uh, is is much better, much more efficient uh, uh, today than it was 20 years ago, um, both for uh, the engines themselves, uh, the way the engines are operated, the way the engines are monitored, uh, sometimes uh, in many cases uh, remotely, uh, the way the ship hulls are designed, uh, the way that the ships themselves are operated and, and routed to ensure uh, that, um, that that their uh, their fuel efficiency is is optimized. So, so th there there are technical, there are operational measures that can uh, that can be implemented and have been implemented. Um, I'm just curious about that. Much. What does so, much mean? Is does that mean five percent, ten percent, a hundred and hundred percent? How how much more efficient are they? Well, well, I, I, I've seen figures quoted by a number of companies whereby they they, they believe that with the, uh, the, the the new technology that's coming online, the way that ships are better operated, um, engines. Uh, better maintain and so on, uh, that the, you can get sort of 10, 15% improved efficiency. But that clearly is nowhere near where we need to be in 20, uh, 2030, less so in 2050. So we will need the introduction of those new technologies, the development and the introduction of those new technologies. We believe that this is an international uh, challenge and therefore it requires an international solution. Uh, and we believe the best body to uh, to drive that forward uh, and to set the regulations globally is the IMO. And, and there is precedent there because uh, they've done that um, in, in other areas, for example, in the introduction of the, uh, the sulfur emission um, caps, uh, initially regionally and subsequently uh, globally. And, and we, we acknowledge that there's frustration that perhaps the IMO is not moving as quickly as it should do. Uh, but let's not forget that the IMO is a an arm of the UN, and it moves at the pace that everyone is um, is comfortable with moving. But I, I go back to my point about the change in administration in the US, where we might see some stronger leadership there, and perhaps uh, 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 qu quicker um, and more satisfactory progress. Let me let me press see. you a bit on on technology because there are lots of technologies out there that people are promoting. Is the, it, does the US, UK Chamber of Shipping, does the IMO, do they actually take a punt on a particular technology, which, which actually look most promising? Because we're talking about hydrogen, LNG, batteries, all sorts of stuff, wind. What, I mean, are we going to go in 100 directions or are we going to focus on one? Well, I, I, I would say that there will be more than one, um, but if uh, to, to try and be Perhaps a slightly oversimplistic, um, I would make a distinction between uh, short sea uh, operations and deep sea operations. 
uh, in short sea operations, uh, the, the, the use of battery technology perhaps will lend itself better than it does uh, for, 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 for longer routes, uh, because um, the, the, the time between um, charging batteries is, is that much shorter. And we see that to an extent, whether it's um, with hybrid uh, vessels uh, already in operation, uh, and, uh, and over time we'll see full electric vessels uh, doing those short, uh, short sea routes. In the longer, for, for the longer routes, I, I, I think, yes, that there, there might well be um, enough progress made in technology, in, in battery technology, in fuel cells, uh, powered by whether it's hydrogen, by ammonia, by something else, biofuels, uh, we might well see progress in that domain. Um, but but I think this, this again, a, a key point is that this needs to be done holistically. It's not a single company. It's not a single country. It's got to be done globally. Um, and, uh, and, and we believe that the work that is being done uh, at the IMO, um, clearly with support from the International Chamber of Shipping and, uh, and others, uh, looking at the possibility of setting up um, an international uh, R&D fund is, uh, is, is a good move. Um, but what, what we would not want to see um, uh, run away from us are, are regional measures, uh, which might well distort the level playing field, um, might well be used as a means of raising uh, funding uh, for reasons other than uh, to reinvest back into uh, the maritime uh, sector and, and to develop those technologies. Um, so we need to work very, very closely together to make sure that that happens. Um, I, I think that actually uh, seeing um, perhaps the, the, the threat or the prospect of regional measures should act as a wake-up call or as an incentive to the IMO uh, to move more quickly than it has done so far. But Just we do believe what you mean by regional done. measures. I mean, give, give an example of, of of what you're talking about here. Well, well, there's the, the talk in, uh, in in the EU of uh, of introducing uh, a, a regional or an EU wide uh, ETS um, uh, as a means also of raising uh, uh, raising uh, taxes, uh, which might or might not be used by um, um, but by, by the community for uh, for, for ship developments in in shipping. Um, but the, the challenge here is that um, it might be perceived to be uh, distorting the market uh, and, and others such as China or Korea or others could well um, uh, cry foul of the fact that, um, um, that there's unfair competition that's being introduced here. So, so that's why I think that uh, it needs to be done uh, globally and it, it needs to be something that can be scalable. So if we need to raise further cash, because I think we need the incentives um, for, 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 for the shipping community to move forward as well. We need financial incentives. Um, uh, and um, at, at the moment, the, 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 the risk, I think, for the first movers is, is too high because the, the technology, A, is not there. And when it comes online, uh, initially, will be prohibitively expensive. Um, so, again, that's where we need the support from government, not just for uh, the, the technology, the fuel, but also the infrastructure that needs to be set up globally. And we need to bring everyone together. Well, that's a that's a great point to bring in to bring in Michael. We talk about the finance. Um, Michael's been in the industry for thirty five years. Um, I've heard a, I have some friends in the Greek shipping industry who were always very skeptical about these sorts of things. There were cycles. Uh, they would ride those cycles, go broke when it was bad, and make make out like bandits when it was good, and you know they didn't really think very much beyond the next cycle. Um, Tell us about how, how you respond to what Bob has been, been saying. Well, I agree with everything Bob has said, and, and um, the, 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 um, the issues he talks about are, are clearly top of the agenda, the seafarer one in particular. Uh, and I want to connect that into the context of what shipping is. I mean, shipping moves $20 trillion worth of cargo each year. Um, but has chosen historically to hide away from regulation where possible, doesn't like paying taxes and doesn't like anyone looking into their affairs. And, and the dominant private ownership in the industry has, of course, enabled a lot of that to, to happen. But at the same time, it's provided a very safe and cheap means of transportation. Um, and particularly through the container sector, has done more to take millions out of poverty through global trade and, and making shipping cheaper, as I said, cheap and efficient. And, and, and I think what the last couple of years, and I think accelerated by the COVID situation, is to put shipping 
bang in the center of people understanding the importance of this industry to every other part of the global economy, including the, the, the technology side. Let's not forget that the technology industry is a significantly huge emitter itself. About 14% of global emissions come from technology companies, which of course is not, um, that they have Big better mining. Better PR people that are able to, to persuade them that they're clean and everything else. But I think it's this, what's happening as a result of um, the industry having to face this decarbonization issue is that it is being forced into confronting an issue that it, it would rather have avoided, or at least does not feel itself responsible for, because in the end, it's around what the energy companies will produce in terms of fuel and what regulators will produce. And as Bob said, you know, the pace of regulation is, is very slow because of being a UN body, but also I think because, as Bob would admit, you know, resistance from different constituencies. And the, it is, as a UN body, it is political, and therefore um, how, how, how votes take place in that forum are going to be influenced by, by more than just, you know, the, the objective sort of technical issues. But I think putting this in the context of what shipping is about, shipping is about uh, the, the increased transparency of what shipping is about, that's really the point I'm making, is about the cargo, not the ship. Now, too many owners historically, including some of your Greek friends possibly, have put the ship first. And of course, that's the physical asset. That is what you know, they've owned or they've operated. That's what's generated the cash flow that has paid back the debt that the banks have provided. But the reality is they're moving someone else's cargo. So the responsibility for emissions is not the ship owner, it's actually the cargo owner. And I think we're going to see, we've already begun to see that. We're going to see a big shift as a result of technology and data capture to show where the emissions are being created in the global supply chain. As, as COVID hit us and, and all I could hear was the white vans driving up and down the streets of London and my doorbell delivering stuff my wife had ordered on the internet, um, is that the emissions from that white van, from wherever it picked up the piece of cardboard wrapped item, creates more emissions per mile than the sea leg from uh, Asia to Europe. And I think it's this relative issue of well, where are the emissions in the supply chain that's going to drive the agenda. Bob makes an important point about other industries, and I would recommend the work of the Energy Transitions Commission chaired by Lord Turner, Dare Turner, well known in this country. They've done a lot of excellent work around the so-called hard to abate sectors, as Bob referred to other sectors facing some of the same issues. So cement and building materials, aviation, shipping, steel, uh, and a couple of others. These are the so-called hard to abate industries where many of the emissions in sort of the, the industrial economy exist. The Energy Transitions Commission is also helping in some other work I'm doing as part of the Getting to Zero Coalition. Bob referred to the, the issue of first movers, and it is a significant issue. I co-chair a working group in the global uh, the, the Getting to Zero Coalition around how do you motivate first movers? And it comes very much to this issue of how do you ensure that whether it's subsidy, whether it is whatever form of support, and ultimately it's about delivering the economic return to the investors ultimately, how do you encourage people to take the necessary innovative risks um, in order to, in the end, reduce emissions? I think we have to keep this in some sense quite simple here. The issue is not about whether it is ammonia, methanol, whatever it is. That's, of course, going to be the technical solution, which will, to a large extent, be driven by industries other than shipping, particularly the energy and power sectors. They will be driving most of that investment. And so shipping, shipping will have to be a partner in that, will be, but will be a minority partner. But the difference this time is shipping has got to be part of those discussions. Too much decision-making and shipping has been sequential and not, and not collaborative. And what we've seen in the last 18 months, I'd say in particular, is a huge amount of greater collaboration around shipping. Bob, Bob referred to, to uh, proposals come out of the, uh, the ICS around this fund. Now, this fund isn't going to be nearly enough to deal with the decarbonization and shipping, but it is a contribution proposed by ship owners through the ICS around how ship owners will make a contribution towards the R&D necessary to bring forward 
the uh, decarbonization of shipping. But we've seen numbers of two trillion dollars for the for the distribution, the infrastructure, as well as shipping. And shipping is a very small part of that. So clearly, it's going to be the significant investments coming from the primarily the energy sector. And then it's going to be a question of uh, how those those can be sort of subsidised. But I want to go back to the point um, and, and why you've got me on this particular um, well, Just session. before you do, could you just talk a little bit about how you incentivize first movers? Because that does seem to me to be a really key issue. I mean, are there... Are, are, there, are there countries which are actually taking a lead here and actually doing something to push first movers? Well, the, yes, there are. And, and, and Bob referred to the UK Clean Maritime Plan, which was a, a sort of parallel um, piece of work going on around the same time as the, uh, the UK government came up with its own uh, 2050 Maritime Plan. But it was, and it's a very interesting document because it looks at the opportunity for the UK as a coastal state not just in terms of the wind opportunity, but also in terms of production of hydrogen, production of ammonia, if you like, the opportunity that, if you like, our physical existence as the UK gives us to play a major role in that. There are other countries, Morocco, Australia, Chile, there are others that have taken a lead through the United Nations and some of these other initiatives that are actually putting a lot of effort into seeing how they can make a shift in their own economy, or they have the natural resources around future fuels that will enable them to play a lead role. But if you want to look at an example closer to home, look at what's happened in the UK offshore wind sector. Many of us um, of, of our generation, if I put it that way, you know, may have been climate change skeptics 10, 15 years ago. There's no question that that combination of investment and subsidy through contracts underpinned by the government has turned offshore wind energy into the cheapest form of energy we have, possible exception, I suppose, being nuclear, but that has other issues. So there are examples where, provided you underpin the commercial incentives for investors to invest, and the technology is there, and, and Bob's right, the scale isn't there, but the the technology is there for shipping where it isn't really for aviation. So shipping has a good opportunity with the right investment to make that transition. But I think it's important not to think of this as a sort of black and white. We don't go from fossil fuels to zero fossil fuels overnight. It'll be a transition period. We know LNG will play quite a large part in that transition. But I, but I think many different types of fuels will be used if the technology around the engines and the and the maritime architecture, the ship architecture, enables that to happen, so I think we, the the, the broader maritime ecosystem does not want to make the VHS Betamax bet, which I know you two will understand. Um, they don't want to make that bet now because because there could be other 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 solutions. But if I can get back to the incentivization, because that was part of this issue of motivating. The reason the banks are involved through the Poseidon principles is because banks provide the bulk of the capital for the shipping industry. Shipping has been an industry that has relied upon banks to lend to ship owners to build ships and supported in many, to a large extent, by export credit agencies in the shipbuilding nations to provide longer term backing for that finance to, to incentivize the building of ships with relatively cheap capital. Now that, that will change over time, because what that did, and it cost several German banks their existence you know, 10 years ago, what that did was fuel unnecessary shipbuilding. It was also an issue of how the US versus Europe took the bar rules and, and, and the amount of capital you needed against loans. So that part part, was part of the problem. So what, what happened was ships were being built, built we didn't need. So the management of capacity, which the industry has shown in the last 12 months to be very effective at, particularly in the maybe too effective for some in the container sector, means that the underpinning, the economics to underpin the investment has not been there because there's been too many ships, too much capital destroyed. And as a result, we have not seen the returns on equity and the solid cash flow needed to provide ship owners with the means to continue to reinvest. The great change now, of course, is this technology change. It is the regulatory change that the industry hasn't had to face before. And that is providing this framework, I think, which will enable the industry to, to thrive. I, I think decarbonization is the single biggest opportunity 
for shipping uh, in my lifetime, in our lifetimes, with the possible exception of digitalization, because they really go hand in hand, because it is the way in which the shipping industry is able to connect either direct with the consumer through digitalization or the way in which you remove many of the inefficiencies of shipping through digitalization and thus enable capacity to be managed much better. Now, regulation is important for, for people like me because bank regulators, whether it's the ECB, the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the United States, are also very focused on the impact the environmental impact of our business and our portfolios. And we've seen that particularly uh, in Europe with the Dutch and the French leading the way there. So the pressure on the pressure on financial institutions from our own regulators around the environmental consequences of the business we do is very much at the forefront. The task force on climate related financial disclosure led by Mike, Michael Carney and Bob uh, Mike. Mark. Michael Bloomberg and 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 uh, and Carney, Mark Carney, you know that that's only now beginning to have a real impact. City itself published our own TCFD report uh, just before Christmas, and I think you will see increasingly from bank regulators that focus. So in a way, with the Poseidon principles, and we've tied the principles to the IMO regulation. So it's around taking the 2050 target Bob referred to, taking the trajectories of the global fleet, breaking that down into the individual vessel types, and measuring our portfolios, what's in our portfolios on a weighted average debt perspective against that global alignment target. And we published the results of 15 of the current 20 signatories, and the areas of 15, not 20, is it was the original signatories in 2019 who actually reported for the 2019 emissions. We reported our alignment against that trajectory. Now, when we started this, and I was asked, because I'm also on the board of the Global Maritime Forum, to look at the finance work stream and to talk to uh, the one of the NGOs, the Rocky Mountain Institute, who were about to publish a paper with the World Bank back in 19, uh, 2017. They wanted to target shipping on individual ship basis, uh, and why you should not finance this ship because its emissions are going to exceed, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to start from fresh and explain that that's not how banking works. We have relationships with our clients. We happen to take security in vessels most of the time. We have relationships which are confidential. We're not going to be told what we will do or won't do by you. Um, but yes, is there a way we can factor in the environmental issues in shipping? And we have to go back to Kyoto in 1997, which is when shipping was initially and aviation were asked to come up with targets. Um, and you know, 2018, the April 2018 date Bob referred to was very key for us in being able to pin what we can do as financial institutions to align ourselves to the targets of the global regulator. Now we know that those that target is going to tighten. We know that the net that the 50 percent by 2050 is going to be net zero by 2050. It's just a question of when that commitment is made. And I think we should expect Glasgow, the COP meeting in Glasgow next uh, this, this November, assuming we're all, we're all up and about and traveling at that time, and it happens, that that will have some significant uh, push, I think, to some of, some of these agendas. But if I can get back to, 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 um, to, to the, the knock-on effects or the further consequences. Following the Poseidon principles, many of the major charterers, led by Trafigura, led by Cargill, Shell, Total, others, have come up with the Sea Cargo Charter, which became effective on the 1st of January. And they're using the same principles as the Poseidon principles, but using a different type of emission count. They're using the EOI methodology as opposed to the AR methodology, one being Europe rather than the global one, but but a slightly different calculation. But they're using that to measure voyage emissions of the ships which they will are chartering and will charter. So you can begin to see a direct commercial aspect to emissions in how ships will be employed. That has a direct impact on the cash flow that will pay back the debt. So you can see you could begin to create this virtuous circle of motivating ship owners to do everything they can to reduce emissions. When one of the key uh, members of our drafting committee 
of the Poseidon principles was Hugo de Stoop, the current now the CEO of Urano, the biggest public tanker company in the world. And he talked a lot about carrot, carrots and sticks. And, and we used to joke about, you know, who, who, who was offering the carrot and who was waving the stick. I think in the end, the stick is going to be waved by regulators. It's going to be waved by, by the cargo owners who want to have the lowest emissions possible in their supply chain. If you, if you think of the supply chain and you think of every company in the physical, particularly in the physical supply chain, who's committing to net zero in, in 2030, 2040, 2050, or China now in 2060, and that's a significant event, I think, in the last few months. If you commit to net zero, you're not going to get to net zero if you are not using other people with the same commitment. And so you create this inevitable virtuous supply chain if you only will do business with people who have the same commitment and who are showing in their own supply chains themselves that they're able to use whatever the technology is and it's got to be make sense economically to reduce emissions now i have this great view that this particular machine here the iphone or whatever the competitor product is you will be able to tap in the emissions on anything you order if you order it by sea, by, by, by Amazon, whatever it is, but emissions data will become available to the consumer, I think, very quickly. But Soren Skou of Mass thinks it'll take up to five years. It's probably somewhere in between the two. We're going to see live emissions data on ships beginning this year. We're using, in the Poseidon Principles, historical data for 2019 because we tapped into the IMO regulation around ship owners having to report that each calendar year. But you can see that as soon as you move to live emissions, that every measurement of emissions will, 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 will shift to being virtual, re real time effectively. And that will start to impact pricing. It'll start to impact carbon pricing. You can see a huge derivatives business beginning to develop out of this. But the other key thing and, and, uh, is really around um, and going back to sort of cargo, is where, where is the capital in the world going? Well, $80 trillion of investable capital in the equity and debt markets is putting ESG issues very high on their agenda. And so the motivation in terms of cost of capital that companies are now raising, whether it's in the equity markets or the debt markets, is beginning to take on a hue, particularly around environmental issues if you're in those sort of industries. And so it has a direct financial impact. And, and that's why this is going to be affecting everyone. But it's in that environment where shipping will become a stable, more profitable industry, because it's going to have to answer to so many more different constituencies. But what it will be doing is it will be making sure that the ultimate environmental cost of what it does, provided it is doing what it does within the regulations, is going to be borne ultimately by the consumer. It's the consumer that buys the cargo that moves and the consumer that is willing to pay because we know that the additional cost of a consumer item from cleaner transport is, is, is next to nothing. And that's why spreading that cost becomes so important. But you've got to have a way of measuring it. And that's why I think emissions data is going to become a key thing in which shipping, instead of being criticized for having the same emissions as Germany, it should be congratulated, as Bob said, for 90% of world trade moving by sea worth $20 trillion only emits 2.5, 2.8%. And we know that that will go down. We know it'll go down. We know it's going up a little bit, but it all depends a little bit on you know, the volume of trade moving and everything else. But actually, I think this is, this is the game changer for the industry. And what we've seen in the last 12 months is skeptics have stopped being skeptical. Everyone realizes that there are no easy answers, but actually all working together towards a common objective is how we'll get this done. All right. Well, that's that's really the point that I would really like to, to ask both of you. I mean, there, there are two things here. One of the incremental changes that you can make by running the existing system more efficiently and with greater concern for the environment. And two, there are the big technological shifts, propulsion, infrastructure, all the things that you need to incentivize to happen, but which will take place over, over a period. What, what, how we get to that, that point where the, the, the big transformative changes 
kick in. They, given the life of ships, given the life of ports, given the difficulty of, of developing uh, to scale the kinds of technologies that you need, what can you squeeze out of the orange first? Can you squeeze another 10%, 15% in terms of efficiency, carbon efficiency, uh, before you actually make this great transformative leap? I, I, I don't know. Bob, what's your view on that? I think on, on, on current predictions, um, the sort of 10, 15% sounds about right in terms of uh, improvement in efficiency uh, with the existing technology uh, by optimizing that technology further and by using ships uh, in a more sensible, a more environmentally friendly way. And there's you know, a simple initiative like, uh, it's called the Port Optimization Calls. Uh, and this is closer cooperation between ports, particularly key ports, and shipping lines, so that instead of having all the ships racing to the port and then sitting around for two days, three days per berth, uh, they have constant exchange of information so that they can reduce their speed and arrive just at the right time. By doing okay, that, months, they're burning less days. fuel to get to their yeah. destination. It seems an obvious point, but it, it, they, they, they burn less fuel uh, but by, by slowing down as they get to their destination. And they then don't sit off the coast emitting CO2 and other pollutants in close proximity to uh, to built-up areas. Uh, and, and that, I've heard of a trial that was conducted by a major European port recently, and that led to efficiencies of almost 10%. Um, so, so we can do more of that. Uh, the technology that we have at the moment, we can uh, we can operate it better, uh, but, but we will need those new technologies and that transformation, and that will take time. And, and I don't see it as a single... Uh, a single flick of a switch in 2035 or 2040, I think it'll be a gradual process and the, there'll be a number of solutions, as, as Michael said earlier on, uh, that, that will play a part to a lesser or greater extent in various sectors as, as we go through the year. Uh, what, uh, what's the role of, of this research and development fund that you're, you're, you're advocating in, in kick, flicking us into that new new world? Well, this is by by generating um, some money, uh, and and it's by no means uh, the entirety. You've you've heard the figures from from Michael, but but it but it's really it, it it's a it shows uh, the the commitment by the ship owners because uh, this has been proposed by uh, by the shipping community, uh, and b it creates a small, uh, relatively small fund, but an important fund that kickstarts the process of. The extensive collaboration that uh, that, that we've that we've both been talking about today, um, because it needs to pull in um, the, the different sectors um, nationally and internationally, and there needs to be some oversight. And we believe that the IMO is the best body to provide that uh, that oversight and uh, and direction. Really, but, but I couldn't agree more with Michael over the the importance of the full supply chain and and, and crucially the consumer at the end of the day. Who will want to know how their goods have been transported halfway across the globe and what I think impact that's, that I think that's a really it. important point if you can get consumer push as it were on this but aren't we a little bit late with a research and development fund i mean we know what the te technologies are the, the question is how you can i mean how you can push them to scale i mean is is that the best way to do it i mean i don't Andrew, I, I look i think and uh, um, within the shipping community there's been a lot of sort of competition for good ideas and stuff and I think one of the good things that's happened in the last 12 months is a lot of respect has been created through collaboration to recognize that the different bodies play different roles in the industry uh, and they have you know depending on their membership they have particular roles to play and stuff and none of us have any monopoly on the truth and stuff and so what as, as what what as Bob has described it, is the shipping, the ship owner community recognizing that they have a responsibility and being willing to pay a price for that through some form of carbon pricing. Connecting that to the overall cost of decarbonizing shipping is, is, is there's no point in trying to connect it because they're they're different things. Part of the slowness you have to put into the energy industry's box because you know it's taken and and still. There are US oil companies that are still much further behind the European oil companies in recognizing the importance of decarbonizing their own businesses and stuff. And I think it's the leadership of Shell, Total, and now BP and Repsol and others in Europe that has begun to change this agenda. And so this, this two trillion number that 
came up from some work done by the University of Maritime Advisory Services with the Energy Transition Commission is an estimate on comes out of work done by Shell and others around, you know, how do you create the distribution infrastructure, let alone the ships, around changing the way in which we fuel global trade. But remember, all that technology is going into fuel cement plants or steel plants or all the other industrial communities that are part of the economy that is also sort of important and users of energy and power. Now, I think the, the point about regulation is sort of important because one of the things that I think has changed is that there has been regulation, if not finally adopted yet through the IMO, but been criticized for not being enough, but it's to do with the design of ships and it will sort of again help move the agenda forward. But in a way, it doesn't matter that the IMO has been slow. Maybe Glasgow will give the IMO um, motivation to do more. In the end, market forces are going to drive this. Regulation can catch up if the shipping industry, together with the shipbuilding industry, the engine manufacturers, and ultimately it will be the cargo owners and consumers, if we drive that agenda forward, let regulation catch up. Now, how will regulation catch up? Because it will have evidence of what works, whether it's technologically, it's what financial markets are willing to invest in. And so the political leadership will help the IMO do that. Bob, Bob's point about, um, you asked him the question about regional schemes, and there's no question, shipping is a global industry with a global regulator um, and regional carbon pricing may ultimately be what happens. It doesn't mean it's the best thing to happen and it isn't the best thing to happen, but unless you can get a global carbon price that everyone signs up to, which, which is unlikely, it's quite possible that shipping will have to deal with various regional schemes, but that will the market will eventually drive that to be global. And that's, that's I think, what's going to you know, come about. And the question really is around the pace of all that. And I think that's what's changed in the last two years, that we're going to see an industrial revolution that would normally take about 50 years, take place in 10 years. And in order to meet the IMO target of 50% by 2050, we have to get zero emission vessels on the water by 2030. And that's the goal of the Getting to Zero Coalition work. Now, that means decisions being made in the next two to three years about the fuels, the alternative fuels, the design of ships, the infrastructure. So. This is why motivating first moves are very important because we won't get those zero emission ships by 2030 if things don't start to happen now. Now, you will have seen, I mentioned Australia, also in Denmark, you've seen many more coalitions come together from different sectors to work on investment in electrolyzers and the production of hydrogen and stuff. So, so you know, I think that when you separate out the extreme views of pro-fossil fuel anti-LNG and stuff. The reality is we're going to have a number of alternative fuels. We're going to have low sulfur fuel continuing for some time. And we're going to have LNG as a significantly important minority, but important transition fuel. The, the methane slip issue is the one issue for LNG, whether it's on the ship or whether it's sort of on land. Uh, and some of the experts like DNV seem pretty um, authoritative that that can be solved quite quickly. That gives you somewhere between you know, a 15 and 30% reduction in, in CO2 emissions. The, the arguments against that would suggest it's a lot lower, but I think the point is, if we can start to measure, measure real emissions, we'll start to see the benefits, and that, through market pricing mechanisms, will add to the ability to motivate new investment. Last question to both of you, and that is, we barely touched China. Uh, China is the elephant in the room or the whale in the sea, I suppose. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, China has punted a great deal on in increasing its trade influence through the Belt and Road Initiative. Is it, Are we in danger of sort of defaulting to China as the biggest player in the field? And we've talked a lot about initiatives in Denmark, but, you know, realistically, Denmark is Denmark. China is an awful lot bigger and an awful lot more important. How do you see China's role in all of this? Bob first. I, I think China will want to um, be seen to be playing a key part in uh, in, in the, uh, uh, the the fight against climate change, um, and but but they they will do. But will so, it want to be the standard setter, or will it be willing to participate cooperatively or to be a centre taker? 
I, I think it depends on how it engages with the rest of the world or how the rest of the world, and in particular the US, um, develops its, uh, its partnership with, with China. And if we see a more collaborative um, and engaging approach from the new administration in the US, uh, then I suspect we will see a more cooperative uh, China. Um, the the, the, the indication, indications that we've seen suggest that, the, that they do take climate change seriously, but they do so in a, in a different way from, uh, from, from the rest of the world. Uh, but that's not to say that their commitment will be any uh, any less uh, any less forceful than uh, than the rest of the world. Um, but 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 th there's got to be a relationship there, uh, and I think uh, the 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 advent of the new administration in the U.S. Uh, provides an opportunity for that. China, after all, is still opening coal-fired power plants. I mean, it may be opening fewer of them, but its its commitment to climate change is perhaps more gradual than uh, than some, even though it's made all sorts of uh, longer term commitments. Bob, do you see, uh, it's Michael, do you see uh, China as a, as a cooperative player in, in this field as, or as somebody who really does want to, to have its view prevail? I, think, I mean, China, the, the China, Chinese economy has become so integrated with the West, particularly with America in many respects because of its support for for the US deficit. But the I don't think shipping is because because it's a global industry, China, I think, needs to participate. And it is an active participant in the IMO and others. I think it needs to be part of a global solution. I don't think China being staying outside of that in the maritime world helps China at all, because China needs to export, China needs to import. And whilst Captain Wei of Costco always wanted a very large fleet, and it is a goal of the Chinese government to have 15%, at least 15% of all China imports and exports carried on Chinese ships. They can't, they can't do it by themselves. They can't operate a separate maritime system because ships have to operate on a, on a global basis under global rules. So I expect them to be an active participant. The commitment to net zero by President Xi for 2060, I think, was significant. It acknowledges, if you like, he's, he's buying another 10 years from most of the Western economies. Um, but I think they recognize that, um, uh, and, they, and they've seen it through um, pollution in their cities, they recognize that for Chinese citizens, they have the same aspirations around clean, a clean environment. So I think on a shipping perspective, I expect China to be fully engaged, fully supportive. The macro political stuff, we, as Bob says, we'll have to see how that engagement takes place. I think the Belt and Road, it's, it's interesting how the Belt and Road has run into some of those difficulties of building projects in countries and lending them the money which they can't afford to pay back. So in a way, you know, the Belt and Road issue may take a second place to, to some of these sort of other, other issues. But I, I hope China plays a very active role. And I, I'm hoping that President Xi will himself appear in Glasgow in November. And that itself will be a huge signal, I think, if he and President Biden are there, that actually what COVID will have done is say there's no point in pointing the finger at, you know, who's who where it started or whatever. We have a global issue here. We have to work together to solve it. Um, and, and that's why I think um, Glasgow is so important. And the role of shipping within those solutions is a huge opportunity for our industry to get the recognition that it really does deserve. All right. Quite clearly, all roads lead to Glasgow and COP26. So uh, can I thank Michael? Can I thank Bob? And can I thank all of you for watching? Many thanks.